Welcome to AP Statistics. We're doing the group formative assessment activity, formerly known as, quote, the hot dog game. Yeah. Now, here we go. Yeah, let's, th there is a studio audience present here today. It's time for the GFA. Yay! Hello, Moose. <laughs> All right, so the first problem is right there. If you're uh, playing this at home, um, then you can just take a screenshot of that. I'm going to pause the camera while students work on it. And so pause. So on this particular GFA problem, um, one thing that you can do is collect the information in a two-way table. On Google, you will either find the answer or you will not. You can say yes versus no. Then on answers.com, it will be either yes or no. The probability of finding the answer on both websites is 0.874. So yes, yes is 0.874 is how I recommend you start setting up the two-way table. Now, when you add up all the Google columns, uh, Google yes adds up to 0.95. Answers.com yes adds up to 0.92. So those of you who did it like this, you probably filled in this box. Oh, by the way, they're saying, to see whether they're independent, there's one of two ways you can look at it. You can either ask yourself the question, is the probability of finding the answer on Google equal, question mark, to the probability of finding it on Google given it's on answers.com, equal, question mark, probability of Google given answers.com, how many of you, when you were investigating the problem, used this particular question to answer it? How many of you used the other question? Um, the other way you could have handled this was look at the probability of finding the answer on answers.com, comparing that to the probability of answers.com given Google. It looks like most of you did it this way. So that means that you have to shrink, with the heat gun, you have to shrink it down to answers that Dot com. So answers.com was right here. Answers.com, yes. So it's really, you don't even have to fill in this number because it's going to be 0.874 divided by 0.92 for the conditional probability. And And so the question is, is that the same thing as the probability of finding it on Google, which is 0.95? So this is the question that has to be answered. When you take 0.874 divided by 0.92, and by the way, um, and let's now see, this is interesting. Um, they actually, the way they did it, if these are equal, then it should be true if we multiply both sides by 0.92. So 0.92 times 0 0.95 is 0 0.874. Let's investigate it. Let's do the calculator work. If this equation is true, then 0 0.95 times 0 0.92 should be equal to 0 0.874. So let's find out what, set quit, 0.95 times 0.92 actually is. It is 0.874. And so they are independent, and it looks like the answer is letter A. I'm going to flip this over. I have not looked at the answer yet this year. Um, and sure enough, letter A is the correct answer. You look at it here. For those of you at home, you can get that to focus. Huh. So anyway, it is letter A was the correct answer. Now, any follow-up questions on this particular problem? Do you see any hands up? Okay, so let's move. Oh, yeah, Peter? Um, how does that like, specifically determine that they're independent? Well, by definition, two events, let's put it in if-then form. The question is, if you didn't hear that um, on camera, the question is, how does this show that two events are independent? If the probability of A is equal to the probability of A given that B has occurred, then A and B are independent events. Now, what's the sense of that? Um, suppose 
A is surviving on the Titanic, 32%. What's the probability of surviving the Titanic, given that you're a first-class passenger? What if that also is 32%? Then you get this sense that it really doesn't matter whether you're a first-class passenger or not. Survival is independent of class. They're independent of each other. The outcome of one event has no influence on the, well, in this case, that one event is B. The outcome event B, like whether B happens or not, it has no influence on the probability of A happening. So that gives you a sense of why this is the analytical standard by which we judge independence. Does that answer your question to your satisfaction? Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Other questions on this one? Let's go to the next GFA problem. Number two, first of all, for those, oh, I'm going to give you your papers back. So I'm going to pause the camera while I grade the previous one, then we'll go to the next problem. Question reads, and there you can take a screenshot of it at home. I'm going to press pause. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Um, I'd like to give you some feedback on this problem. By the way, if you're listening at home and you, you haven't done the student survey yet, please go to the uh, go on campus to stats, click on topics, general general resources. You will see the period two survey link. So, Lucy, have you have you done it yet? Have you done the student survey? Okay. So, make sure you do that now during free moments in this contest. Well. I saw a lot of people drawing bell curves on their papers that had a mean, a normal model with a mean of 200 inches, 210 inches, standard deviation is unknown. So you have a 210 here. And what's the standard deviation of 20% have rate and fall under 200? So we know this cutoff is 200 and 0 0.2, 20%. There should be four numbers in the chart, the Z-score, is the number that's missing here. And um, let's go to mechanics, model mechanics, to write Z equals X minus mu over sigma. <coughs> so no need for an equal sign there. So we can find the Z score on the calculator using inverse normal. So really this problem is a fantastic semester exam review problem. We go to um, distribution do inverse normal and we just need the left area in this case the left area was given as 0.2 so the corresponding z-score is negative 0.841621 so we have the equation negative in fact just for giggles we're going to bring in the work from the calculator wait that's not funny Oh, if only you understood. So we have this number right here from the calculator. We can see that the correct next move is to write negative 0.8416 equals x, which is 200, minus mu, which is 210, over the unknown sigma. This is the equation that you should have solved for sigma. And when you solve that equation for sigma using algebra 1, you get the same score that you got. Everyone came up with letter C was the correct answer. So, yep, sure enough, letter C, and there's the work that they showed. So, nice work on that. Um, it's a lot of, looks like there's going to be a lot of high scores here. Come and retrieve your paper. Uh, first of all, friends, We got a first. I did. It doesn't change. Congratulations, perfect scores so far. And now for GFA number three. Super close to <laughs> Okay, here's the next problem. It's being revealed to those watching on camera, and now it's being revealed to you. Okay, so this is a... Uh, Admittedly, it's a challenge question. Let's take a look at what on earth is going on with this particular problem. Now, the truth is there is a tree diagram that could help you understand what's going on. If 8% of the public say they trust Congress and we randomly sample 10 people, then the tree diagram would have the following characteristics. 
point ninety two. The first person that you poll would either trust T or T C trust compliment. Trust or not trust. Okay. The second person you poll would be so now we're up to four leaves. Trust, trust compliment. Trust, trust compliment. And each one of these, they're independent events, so it's 0 0.08, 0 0.92. The probabilities don't change as you go down, 0 0.92. You would end up with 10 layers. If you kept on drawing the tree diagram for 10 people, 2 to the first is 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed leaves is 8. 2 to the 10th is 1,024. So this tree diagram would have 1,024 leaves on it. But the question is, What's the probability that at least one person trusts Congress? Here's the thought. The probability of at least one can be rewritten as one minus the probability of the complement. What's the probability, or what is the complement of at least one person trust Congress? That is exactly one person or exactly two, exactly three, all the way up to exactly ten. The complement means the other side of the coin, so to speak, or what would be disjoint or mutually exclusive with at least one person trusts Congress. If it's not at least one person trusts Congress, then what is it? It's what? It, it means None of, um, trust none of them trust Congress. The complement of at least one trust Congress, that's exactly one, or exactly two, or exactly three, all the way to exactly ten. So of these 1,024 leaves, some of them will be in the at least one person trust Congress category. The other leaves will be in the zero people trust Congress. Together, those two Disjoint, mutually exclusive categories will add up to what percent of the leaves? 100%. So you can just subtract something that's much easier to calculate, and that is zero people trust Congress, which is just not trust, not trust all the way down. So there's only one of the 1,024 leaves that represents zero people of those 10 trust Congress. So that would be um, trust, only 8% trust. So that would be 1 minus 0.92 to the 10th. Point this, this is what you would type into your calculator. That's a powerful counting technique, is that if it seems, if a problem feels like it's too hard, and some of you, when you saw this problem, there was a collective laugh. It was like, what? How could we possibly do this? When you feel that urge, to laugh at a problem, that's a signal that you may want, you may not want to calculate the problem directly, too complicated. You might want to calculate the probability of the complement of that problem and then subtract from one. And that's exactly what you do here. By the way, on your calculator, one minus 0.2 to the tenth comes out to be clear. One minus 0.92 carat 10 is 0.5656. That was answer. D. So there's a little probability lesson there for you. When it's tough to do a probability problem, consider calculate, calculating the probability of the complement and then subtracting from one. Noah, question. How can 8% of 10 people say that? Well, no, this is for the population, not the sample. For the population, 8% say they trust Congress. Now let's take a look at a sample of 10 people. In the sample of 10 people, there's 1,024 oh. different outcomes of that survey. One of those outcomes will be all 10 of them trust Congress. The probability of, the probability of 10 saying that they trust Congress, that would be 0 0.08 to the 10, a very small number. The probability that zero of them trust Congress is 0 0.92 to the 10th. Now we've talked about two of the 1,024 leaves. There's many other combinations in there. Okay, now that was a, a learning event. Now it's time for the next GFA problem. You're probably wondering, do you think we'll uh, actually know how to do this next problem? I think you will. Here it is for the people at home. And you can take a screenshot of that. I'm gonna pause the camera while you work on it. And at GFA number three. Now we are given 
P of X is 0 0.25, and P of Y, we'll say that says P of Y is 0 0.40. And we also are informed of P of X given Y is 0 0.20. The mystery is what's the probability of Y given X? Okay, now one thing I'll tell you is there's a formula for the probability of Y given X. It's like a lower branch probability. Lower branch can always be found by taking leaf divided by upper branch. So probability of y intersect x divided by the probability of x is one way you could look at this. Now, um, so if we're going to handle it this way, using this formula, which seems reasonable, um, what we can do is, first of all, take inventory and note that we know what P of X is, is 0.25. What we do not know is P of Y intersect X. We're going to have to get a handle on that one. So Y intersect X, that's going to be, um, that's going to be the probability of Y times the probability of X given Y is one way to write it. Another way to write the probability of Y intersect X, since the Y and the X there are interchangeable, you could also I mean, if you want to think of Y as the upper branch of the tree diagram and X as the lower branch, you could write it like this. Another option you have for writing the original problem as probability of X times what? If you started the leaf by saying the upper branch is P of X, what would the lower branch be? Y given X. So take whichever one best fits the given information. Since we know X given Y, I would recommend this one right here. So we can take the probability of y, which is 0.4, probability of x given y, which is 0.2. So I think it's going to be 0.4 times 0.2 divided by probability of x, which is 0.25. I really believe that's a correct setup. And when you do the setup like that, I believe the answer comes out to letter C. Uh, at least that's what allowed you to uh, 0.32. Yep. So... Letter C, 0.32 was the correct answer. So, any questions on this one? Um, how many of you took an approach that was basically the same process, the same thinking process you kind of focused in on? Okay, great. So, a lot of you have your hands up. But the formula that we needed for this was shrunken portion, the shrunken portion of the universe divided by uh, no, it's, uh, I'm sorry, not the shrunken portion, but you could call it either the cell, the football, or the leaf. Basically, the intersection divided by the shrunken universe. So I'm just going to pause for a second while I grade and hand back the GFA problem. Here's the next GFA problem. And as I'm about to rotate it, if you have really good eyes, you might be able to see the answer on the back. Uh -oh. All right, here it is. This problem is, it is estimated that 20% of all drivers do not signal collective gasp when changing lanes. In a random sample of four drivers, what's the probability that at least one doesn't signal when changing lanes? Give it a go. This is a GFA. GFA stands for Group Formative Assessment. That's for Moose and Teresa's benefit. All right. Okay, let's talk about this one. Um, this is similar to the one that we did previously where there was a collective lap instead of 10 in the sample, though this time there's only four in the sample, so you could estimate the first person that's randomly sampled, they either signal or signal complement, 20% do not signal, so 80% signal, 20% do not signal. And then this tree diagram would have a total of two to the fourth. There's 16 leaves in it if you completed the whole thing. And that's a lot of leaves to calculate. You don't really want to do it. The probability that at least one doesn't signal is one minus the probability of zero do not signal. Okay, so if so, um, Zero do not, what does that mean? Zero do not signal? 100% signal. That means they all signal, that's another way, that's why you have to bring the English language and its correct interpretation into stats class. It's like, what does it mean that zero do not signal? That means all signal. And if all of them signal, that means it's 0.81 minus 0.8 to the fourth. That's how I would write it. 
1 minus 0.8 to the fourth is letter B. That's my calculation. Let's see what they say on the back. They agree that it's letter B. It's a binomial situation because there's two possibilities. Either they signal or they don't signal. And so just like there's only two types of weather every day, there's only two types of weather. It's either snowing for part of the day or it's not snowing for part of the day. So you'd be amazed at how often you can set up a real world situation, model it with a binomial situation in a tree diagram. Now you could have three possible options in the tree diagram, but this is the one we use a lot. So I'm gonna to pause to grade these. All right, friends, we do have a follow-up question for this. The question is, has to do with a possible alternate wording of the question. So if they had asked the question instead of What's the probability that at least one doesn't signal? What if they had asked the, the question, what is the probability um, that two or more doesn't signal? Okay, now, just for ease of answering the question, I am going to suggest that, first of all, we consider the situation where what if instead of four people in the survey what if we randomly sample three drivers, okay? So, and we'll, three, three drivers, two or more. I mean, it could be four, yeah, okay, fine, we'll do four drivers. Yeah, that's what you asked about. So, four drivers. We would actually have to draw the 16 leaves. Now, this does get simplified a little bit when we use the binomial theorem. Um, you might remember in pre-calculus, learning the binomial theorem, that x plus y to the n can be expanded to be uh, n choose 0, x to the n, y to 0 plus n choose 1, x to the n minus 1, y to the 1, plus n choose 2, x to the n minus 2, y squared plus dot, 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 plus n choose n, x to the 0, y to the n. That's an expansion of x plus y to the nth power. So n in this case would be the number of drivers, and then the two cases would have to add up to one. X and y would be the probabilities to add up to one. That's the general answer to your question, but in particular with four drivers, they either signal or they signal complement. So these would be 0.8 coming all the way down. So if I were to write this sideways, this would be 0.8 to the fourth, 0.2 to the zero. Writing sideways, this one would be 3.8 and 1.2. So this is 0.8 cubed and 0.2 to the first. This third leaf is 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.8. So this is also 0.8 cubed times 0.2 to the first. And so you would have to go through and write out all 16 leaves and then circle the leaves that correspond to two or more does not signals. So this is only one does not signal, one does not signal. So you would go through and every leaf of the 16 leaves, I can tell you how many there would be. Um, it would be from the four choose two do not signal, um, or it could be four choose three do not signal, or it could be four choose four do not signal. So do not signal, if two do not signal, that means it's 0 0.2 squared, 0 0.8 squared. If it's three do not signal, it's 0 0.2 cubed, 0 0.2 to the first. If it's four of them do not signal, it's 0.2 to the fourth, 0.2 to the zero. Now, four choose zero, four choose one, four choose two, four choose three. Those are the numbers in row four of Pascal's triangle. Row four of Pascal's triangle is one, four, six, four, one. So that's how I know that this is the number six, this is the number four, and this is the number one. So the answer to your question is that it would be 6 times 0.2 squared times 0.8 squared plus 4 times 0.2 cubed times 0.2 plus 1 times 0.2 to the 4th times 0.2 to the 0. Those are the, those are the possibilities. <laughs> but we're basically just at 4, a 6. There's 11 leaves. Of the 16 leaves, there's 11 of them that satisfy that condition of 2 or more does not signal. So and I'm going to pause it while I hand back the sheets. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. The last GFA problem for this contest. 
then you'll turn it in is this one there it is you can try it at home i'm going to pause the camera and so let's uh talk about this first one first of all the mutually exclusive case is the least complicated so a union b is going to be the probability of a plus the probability of b in the event that there is no overlap between events a and b so look venn diagrams are good for something they help us visualize this and so we're given that this is point three, that's the union. Um, no, we're given point seven is the union. And one of the constituents is point three, that is probability of A is point three. So the other one has to be point four. And I heard some of you talking about how the answer has got to be either A or B, because it's clear that the probability of B is point four in the event or under the condition that A and B are mutually exclusive. So how about if they're independent? Well, if they're independent, then what do we do with our given information? We, uh, we have a formula for the probability of, first of all, if they're independent, we know they're not disjoint. That's the first conclusion you draw. So the probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. So if they are independent, we still know that this is 0.7. And the probability of A is still standing at 0.3. We don't know the probability of B in this case. That's what they're asking for. And the question is, what is the probability? So this is unknown. I'll, ca I'll call it just probability of B. We don't have to use another symbol to represent it. Now, A, uh, oh yeah, qu question? All right, so probability of A intersect B. Now, A intersect B, that's a leaf. And so that's going to be the probability, we could say probability of A times the probability of B given A, that's the intersection. And the interesting thing is that the probability of B given A, since they're independent, is going to be the same thing as what? Uh, yeah, probability of B given A can be interchanged with simply the probability of B. Because they're independent, probability of B given A can be simplified to probability of B. Now, probability of A is known. Here's the equation you have to solve. 0. 0.7 is 0. 0.3 plus basically X minus 0. 0.3 X. So it's like, oh, it's algebra 1 again. Subtract 0. 0.3 from both sides, you get 0. 0.4. And x minus 0.3x is 0.7x. So the thing we're looking for is 0.4 divided by 0.7. According to the calculator, 4 sevenths is about 0.571. And oh, they, they just said there's point is 4 sevenths. So that's why letter B was the correct answer. So um, we've seen so many creative ways for problem authors to come up with ways to check to see if you understand not only the A union B formula, but also the A intersect B formula under the conditions of both disjoint, not disjoint, independent, not independent. That's basically a review for Monday's test. This is where you need to be for Monday's test. On the worksheet that you've been doing, we're going to... Uh, 0.07. We're going to say that the probability of this is circle A, circle B, circle C. We have new shapes. When you have three circles intersecting in a Venn diagram, you have this shape in the middle where A and B and C, the intersection of all three. That shape is, uh, in my classroom, it's called the guitar pick because it's shaped like a guitar pick. You've got um, this shape here, which is... Um, not universally referred to as the alien forehead look. So it's like, you know, it's just the forehead of an alien. It also looks like the Batman. <laughs> like, it also looks like the Batman but what? Like, but like the Batman symbol, but like shaded. The Batman the symbol, but oh, shaded. Yeah, OK, that's good. Or maybe even like a, a bat boomerang. Yeah. Yeah. Bat boomerang. Now, other shapes that we have here are the uh, this shape here is a new one, and in this past, students have noticed the similarities, the similarities between that shape and the shape of the mitre worn by the Catholic Pope. So, now, um, 
I mean, sometimes students say, well, that's a Pope hat. I think it's more respectful to say it's a mitre. It's the mitre <laughs> shape. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Pope hat. The Pope hat. That's pushing it. It's pushing it, friends. Okay, let's have some respect here for all cultures. <laughs> Not, not easiest thing to erase here. Lock. Lock. This must be fun for you. Lock. 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 And lock. And now I can erase the rest, I think. Oh, can't undo that. Okay. <laughs> um, it's done. What's done is done. Alien forehead. So let's assume that it wasn't told. So you actually have to be told that the probability of being in the green area is zero, which means probability of A, well, let's see. No, that's actually not necessarily true. Because of the overlap, I am going to tell you, and some of you assumed it, even though it was... It, it has to be told to you, but suppose the probability of being in circle C is 0.1. What's the probability of D given A? Um, well, what's going on here is that the, uh, I mean, you, you could think of D as, as the first letter in the word disease, but it is given that the probability of D given A, and suppose there's three categories here and each one either has the disease or disease complement does not have the disease so disease disease complement so suppose that the probability of d given that you're in the a category maybe these are geographic regions geographic regions a b and c so we can fill in on the tree diagram 0 0.3 0 0.6 and 0 0.1 um and there's a lot of ways in that which that makes a lot of sense if we're talking about a population a global population that accounts for 100% of the people, then we've got 30% in region A, 60% in B, the other 10% are in C. So D given A is 0.85, puts this here. You have to take the initiative then to put 0.15 here. So that's what the 0.15 is doing. Probability of disease given B is 0.80. So this is 0.20. Disease complement given B is 0.20. And D given C is given as 0 0.71, so it's got to be 0 0.29. There are six leaves to fill in. So to find the probability of a randomly selected person having the disease, what you could do is just add up these three leaves. So it's like this disease leaf. So um, those three leaves, it would be whatever you get when you take 0 0.3 times 0.85, Plus, another way for um, success on the disease is 0.6 times 0.8. What's the third one? There's three leaves all together then. 0.1 times 0.71. So that's the setup that you would use for that one. Now, I'd like all of you to try number two on your own. What's the probability of being from geographic region A, given that you do have the disease? So try number two, you uh, actually, you know what, has anyone filled in all six leaves numerically yet? You can report those to me. Andrew, go ahead. Uh, probability of... Just, just the, the number, that's all I want, is this number right here. 0 0.255, 0 0.045, 0 0.48, 0 0.12, 0 0.071, 0 0.029. Okay. So, can someone give me not the final answer, but what would be the setup? What numbers would you put into, it'll, it'll be a fraction, for probability of A given D? Cell over leaves, it'll be leaves over shrunken universe. Andrew, do you have that one also? You would add 0.255 plus 0 0.0. Wait, which one is this, number two? Number two. Oh, got it, never mind. 0.255. It will be 0.255 upstairs. That's a, it's got to be A intersect D, which is 0.255 over, yeah. So it'll be a leaf over sum of leaves. And you got that by combining what three leaves? 0.255, 0 0.48, and 0.071. So it's 0.255 plus 0.48 plus 0.071. Yeah, so it's basically the answer to problem one became the denominator here.
And then we can also look at what's the probability of being from region B, given that you don't have the disease. So you would do B intersect does not have the disease. So look at it analytically, it's the probability of B intersect disease complement divided by the probability of disease complement. So B intersect disease complement is 0.12, and then the sum of these that don't have the disease would be the 0.045 plus 0.12 plus 0.029. We've basically taken out the heat gun and the universe shrinks down from one down to this sub-universe of no disease, disease complement. You remember the day Kennedy came up and applied the heat gun and actually circled three individual. Um, it's, yeah, it's harder to visualize how shrink wrap could actually you know, shrink down into three bubbles, but that's what happens here. Any questions on this one? So. That's, uh, that's a two-way table. It is possible to take the six leaves and arrange them into a two-way table of disease, disease complement, regions A, B, and C. In case you prefer to apply heat guns to a two-way table, it would, you would just go ahead and put them right in there. Uh, disease A is, is 0.255. Go ahead and see if you can place the six leaves into the six cells. Remember, a cell is a football as a leaf. So I've got them here in case you want to take a look. By the way, how many of you prefer to apply the heat gun to a two-way table in a situation like this? You would be inclined to go the extra step and take the six leaves, put them into a six cells of a table. How many of you are just fine leaving the tree diagram though there and applying the heat gun to the six leaves of the tree diagram? You can do it either way. I don't really care which way you do it. Let's go to the next page unless there's any questions. Any questions on this one? This is the last lesson of the semester, by the way. So, all right. So here we go. Next page. And what's this? Okay, parts. A company manufactures electronic components for home entertainment systems, buys electrical connectors from three suppliers. The company prefers to use suppliers A or supplier A because only 1% of those connectors prove to be defective. So, once again, it's, it's like instead of diseases, we've been talking about diseases a lot. How about we just talk about whether a part is defective or not? Defective, defective complement. So it's either defective or it's not. So would you please attempt to take all, first of all, fill in the tree diagram, try to get all six leaves, and then answer these questions. I'm going to pause the camera so you can have time to work on that on your own. You might want to pause it so you can read it. I have the tree diagram set up. Can someone report to me, those of you who did it like this with the lower branches being 0 0.01, 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.02, and 0 0.96, 0.04, can you report to me in that order, what were the six leaves you've already multiplied them out? Kennedy, do you have them? Yeah. Go ahead. 0 0.007, 0 0.693, 0 0.004, 0 0.196, 0 0.004, 0 0.096. Okay, so you can put them into a two-way table if you want, but can someone give me the analytic representation of the question, what's the probability that your component came from supplier A, given that you, and you find out it's defective, what would the analytic representation be, Peter? Well, the probability of A getting... Yeah, what's the probability of getting your part from supplier A, given that what you know for sure is that it is defective? So. We want to find the probability of A intersect D divided by the probability of defective. So I think we need the A intersect D leaf. It is a leaf, so it's 0 0.007 over, and the probability of defective would be these three leaves, 0 0.007 plus 0 0.004 plus 0 0.004, whatever that comes out to be is the answer. Be careful when you're typing it into a calculator. Um, because the parentheses on the calculator are going to make a difference here, I would recommend you type it in like this, 0 0.007 divided by the quantity, 0 0.007 plus 0 0.004 plus 0 0.004. So I guess it does, it's 46%, huh, given that it's defective. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised it's that high. That, that's that high. Um, but I guess that's what it is. Yeah. 
So yeah, higher than what I expected, but I do, after considering it further, I have to agree. Now, uh, we are going to review on Friday. The homework number three is due on Friday test. Unit six is Monday. Then we've got a cumulative on block day of next week, I believe. Review for the exam on Friday of next week. So thanks for coming. Have a good night.